conclude today's webinar, Snow and Ice Control. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and I want to welcome our presenter, who is Ron Osman. He is a 30-year veteran of the Ohio Department of Transportation, and he plowed snow for all 30 years that he was with the DOT. Um, we are so fortunate now that he's willing to come out of retirement a few times a year to provide training for our local public agencies who participate in the LTAP Center's training program. So I'm going to go over just a couple quick housekeeping items, then I'll turn you over to Ron. First off, if you haven't been on a webinar with us before, I'd like for you to please look for the question box in the GoToWebinar box, and if you would drop me a higher hello in there, just so I know you found it, because that is where we're going to be accepting your questions all throughout this webinar. I see a hi in there from Jeff Thomas already, so thank you. Appreciate that. The next thing I want to make sure you're aware of is that in the handouts section of the GoToWebinar, panel we have three items for you and if you want to download those you can click on them and download them to your computer um, if for some reason your computer doesn't want to cooperate with the download we will be emailing out links to those items as well once the webinar has completed and we are attempting to record the webinar so if the technology cooperates hopefully we'll have a recording that you can go back to and revisit for the great information that Ron's going to share with you so with that I'm Ron are you ready yeah I'm all set okay. thank you very much all for yours. the introduction Victoria so thank you welcome everybody to the snow and ice overview webinar and this class I used to tour all the uh, state we make it available and I'd go out and do about a three hour presentation on it this class is based off of ODOT snow and ice refresher course and we've added information from uh, my travels around the state as well as information from the Clear Roads and Salt Institute uh, Snow Fighters Manual. So my experience, like Victoria said, I have 30 years of snow and ice operations, and I got my start over in Dark County, which is a rural county. We have two lane highways here, no interstate. And then I was promoted up to a training officer and plowed snow in the interstate areas uh, my last several years of employment. And definitely a night and day experience. And I'll try to share some of my experiences over those 30 years. The slide you're looking at is one of our way back slides. I wanna say in the 50s, you know, the old equipment and that we had back then, the guys told me stories. You had to have two operators in it and they didn't really have hydraulics. The guy, the second guy would have to sit there and pump a hydraulic pump to raise and lower that plow. And then you had to manually shift it left and right. And then to put salt out on the roadway, that second, uh, the co-driver had to climb in the back of the dump truck and shovel it out by hand. Of course, nowadays it's all done in the cab with one operator. Just flip a few buttons and you're putting material out, you're picking the plow up left and right. So we've really come a long way over all these years. So again, I've talked about the Salt Institute and some of the information from the handbook coming from their Snow Fighters handbook. Uh, sorry to see the uh, Salt Institute sort of close up operations last year, but you can still find this manual online for downloading and reference material. The information is still quite current. Clear Roads. I hope all of you are familiar with the Clear Roads operation out there. Um, a number of states have pulled their money into doing research into snow and ice operations, which are mainly aimed towards uh, interstate highway operations, but there's a lot of information that uh, townships and counties and that can use in their snow and ice operation. You'll notice uh, when I pull a slide out of some of their training modules, you'll see that clear roads icon there at the bottom. So page one here, so the picture here is from Licking County Engineers. I really like the shot. These folks, they uh, leased their dump trucks on a 10 year rotation. And then uh, they were telling me last time I was there that all the trucks on the left were rotated out. And this year, all the trucks on the right will be rotated out. So they're able to, to lease for 10 years and then buy another replacer fleet. So I thought it was a real good concept there. 
And then, okay, I see uh, audience questions in on the chat side. If you have questions, go ahead and type those in. At the end of this lesson one, I'll take a few minutes to answer those questions. If you stump me on a question, I'll tr try to spend time after class today to find you an answer. And if that doesn't work, at the end of tomorrow's class, I have a lot of reference material and contact information. You can send me your questions and I'll go find an answer for you. So with snow and ice operations in that, it's usually our primary maintenance operation. We're dropping 20 to 25% of our budget into snow and ice operations. You know, we have you know a lot of research in that that we put into making snow and ice operations very efficient. And of course, we have a high impact on essential services out there, and we'll look at that. You know, our traveling public is traveling more than three trillion miles a year. You know, 75% of us commute to and from work, and 80% of the inner city travel is on our highway system. So you can imagine what would happen if we shut down the roadways because we couldn't keep them open due to snow and ice operations. So those economic impacts out there, people have to get out to retailers. You know, they got to buy their goods or groceries and that. You know, factories and that are now operating on a just-in-time manufacturing basis. You know, I can use Honda in uh, Marysville. They have a lot of feeder plants. We have one in Greenville. And... They've got to get their materials just in time to Honda at Marysville so they can put their cars together. You know, I've heard stories that when it starts snowing, Honda's calling ODOT saying, hey, our roads will be clear because we've got to get our uh, materials into our main factory. Web-based sales. You know, who would think Amazon is one of the biggest online sales groups out there in today's world? You know, they're hiring their own delivery people to deliver out there. And they got to be able to get their product, you know, to the customer, to us. You know, impact. You know, what happens if we shut down our interstate system, uh, the entire state of Ohio, due to a snow and ice event? You know, studies out there say it can be anywhere from three to seven hundred million dollars per day in direct and indirect cost. Ohio falls in the three hundred million dollar per day. And this study was done a few years ago. And tomorrow's class, I'll give you some reference on where you can find that study at. Um, again, with this class being a overview, we're hitting a lot of information and uh, real short bites of information. And I can give you some reference material to uh, look at the more detail in some of this information. So the trucking industry, they're saying they're losing $2.2 billion to $3.5 billion a year due to road closures, due to snow and ice events out there. So you see how big of an impact we have out there and how important it is for us to be out there plowing the roads and keeping the roads clear for uh, commerce to uh, uh, continue. So our goals, you know, keep the traffic moving. Keep the industry going, you know, at or near normal pace. You know, level threes, we shut everything down. You know, back home in Dark County, we had one level three de uh, declared. We had the county engineer was tired of all the gawkers going out on the roadway. I, I'm sure all of you have had that person that was stuck and they wanted to go get my beer. I had to go get my two packs of cigarettes out someplace. Or I just wanted to see what the snow looked like. It was snow and we had to get out of the house. And they get out on the roadway and they block the roadway. And that's what was happening out on our county roads. They get out there, get a car car stuck. The county plows could not get through the county roads. So the engineer talked to the sheriff, declared a level three, shut the whole place down, shut all, shut the whole county down. After that was uh, cleared up, the level three went away. All our businesses called for a meeting with the sheriff's department. You know, I'm pretty sure we had somebody from Honda come in and have a few words. And they were letting them know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that level three cost them because they had to shut their plants down. It took hours to shut a plant down, then it took them a full day to get the plant up and running. They have heat treating um, uh, furnaces there. They have plastic uh, processing plants. They had to get everything up and running. And the sheriff didn't realize just how much of an economic impact this made. And he said publicly, he will never declare a level three. So that might go on. I've heard this throughout my travels that other areas will not declare that level three because of the huge economic impact it'll have. 
Of course, we want fewer accidents, injuries, and deaths with the traveling public. So keeping that road clear is real important. We'll touch on environmental impacts as we go through the class. But again, we wanna be conscientious of the environment. You know, the materials we're putting down on the roadway, you know, impacting the environment. And again, our first responders need to get through, you know, law enforcement, fire trucks, and ambulances and that. So in doing the job right, you know, we're trying to balance, you know, three things. The societal needs, their ability to get out and about, the uh, economic constraints that we have. You know, we determine our level of service on what we're going to do with snow and ice based on what our budget is going to permit. You know, Dark County, our county engineer prefers uh, putting money into hot mix and into bridge construction during the summer. So they run pretty much grits. It's like an 80-20 blend, 80% grits to 20% salt. So they can uh, save that money and use out there. I've got municipalities tell me, yeah, they want to keep traffic going. So they use a lot more salt on the roads to keep the roads clear. But that depends on what your level of services is. That's determined by your county engineer, county commissioners, your city councils and that. And again, we want to be good stewards of our environment out there. So some best practices, key things to do out there for snow and ice removal is we should have a material application guideline. We should have a route priority guideline. We should be familiar with our routes and weather forecast out there. And we'll talk about our experience. We're gonna talk about all four of these points in the next few slides. So this is ODOT's material application guidelines. And hopefully all of you have something similar to this. This was updated last year, and it's a very um, simplified version compared to what we've had in the past. And again, it gives us our conditions, our equipment, our pre-storm light operations, our light storm, heavy storm operations out there. So, you know, the big thing here that I, I note on here is that uh, maximum application. Okay, and I think you guys can see my course there should be like maximum of 400 pounds and when I was working at the county level our maximum was 600 pounds you know through smart salt strategies we've been able to reduce our salt usage by a third up front and with this using more and more blended liquid direct liquid application we're looking at reducing our material usage even more more cost savings and a higher return on investment so we will talk about pre-storm or anti-icing, and we'll talk about de-icing as well throughout the uh, uh, course today. So this one is out of our Salt Institute uh, manual. I like this one because it talks about hours on route, you know, a two hour route, three hour route. And I don't know how everybody does their route. I know Dark County, our county engineer, they're telling me they have two guys in a truck, and it might take them eight hours to do one round on their route. But again, they aren't putting a lot of salt down. But it's good to keep in mind that if we have routes, you know, we do our studies to determine what our optimum route is, that if it's a two hour route or we can't get away from doing something under three hours and we're gonna put material down, then we're going to need to allow a little bit extra material on the roadway for the longer route uh, times so that the material won't dilute out and we have that risk of refreeze. So again, with our route application guidelines and goals, it'll tell us our treatment of our routes, our goals during the event, our cleanup after the event, you know, our cleanup after uh, uh, the plowback after the, the cleanup of the routes. And again, we want to keep everybody in mind, you know, our businesses and schools, our EMS vehicles and our motoring public. So this is an updated route priority. No, it isn't. It's the old version of it. I'm sorry. Our old version has first, second, and third priority. And oh, let me go to the next slide. There we are. So this is our updated version. And you see red for priority and blue for secondary. Again, this was done for simplification. Plus, we'll see in our next slide here that uh, we've changed our uh, 
route application guidelines, but our primary routes, you know, we're trying to keep clear edge line to edge line throughout the event, you know, and keep those hazards and that accidents to a minimum in that. And then on our secondary routes, we're going to do our best to keep the routes open, but because the traffic counts don't justify us pouring sand or sand, salt out on our roadways 24 seven, we're going to modify our our service delivery from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. or two hours before rush hour. And we're going to put a maximum of 200 pounds of salt per lane mile. Again, that's being more efficient, more cost effective of our salt usage. And like I said, the traffic counts don't justify us putting that much expense into it. So that's why we have those secondary routes here. And then when the declared end of the storm is done, you know, our primary routes, we have a goal of getting those routes back within 10 mile per hour of the posted speed limit within two hours. And then the secondary routes, we try to get it within that 10 mile per hour uh, speed limit within four hours. So it gives us more time on the secondary routes. So again, a lot of good information here and uh, with us simplifying everything. And then at the end of the event, you know, we'll go through and we'll clean up our uh, mailboxes and that on our secondary routes and that. We'll make sure that the snow is stockpiled far enough off the road for the next event out there. So our experience as operators out there, you know, where do we get that from? Training. The good old days, the guys that taught me how to plow snow, I was hired in December 14th of 81. I was plowing snow December 17th of 81. The guy that taught me how to plow told me that his training was get in the truck and drive it. That's all the training he had. You know, for me, I was given eight hours of training. You know, I sat down and rode shotgun with him for four hours and he told me the ropes, told me some stories and that. And then for four hours, he watched me. And then that night, I double-headed with another guy that watched what I did. We plow the center out, plow back, and they critiqued me. And then my supervisor would follow me every now and then and give me pointers on what I could do to improve things. And that was my training. You know, nowadays at ODOT, they get hired in. We have the highway tech series that they go through. It includes snow and ice modules. We have salt seminars at the count, county level, the district level. When you get hired into the county, you have to go through 40 hours of documented snow and ice training, you know, and that's with experienced plow operators are going to take you out on the road. They're going to get you used to the equipment. And then they have supervisors that will do ride alongs as well. And once you get to that 40 hours, your supervisor and usually some employees that have trained you will sit down and chat with you. And if they feel comfortable with you driving a snow and ice uh, snowplow they're going to sign you off to go out there you know and you can tell them if you don't feel comfortable that you say i need a little bit more hours and that and they'll give you more training before they put you out on the roadway so there's a lot more going on out there on training you know knowledge where do we get more knowledge internet is wonderful for knowledge clear roads they've got one hour webinars you can go on their website and you can play your webinars and a lot of really good information out there the iowa dot they have a uh, youtube series back when we were uh, when i was working with photon as a training officer we did uh, we popped in their videos we had all their videos we had like 15 videos on snow and ice operations and we popped those in to show students they're wonderful they update them they're now high def they do direct liquid application training and it's all on YouTube, and I've got a link to that at the uh, end credits on tomorrow's class. So the internet is wonderful. Networking with people. You know what I liked about going out on the roadway? I'd have a county engineer bring me in. They bring in all the township garages and that, and some of the cities, and they would network between themselves on snow and ice operations during the breaks and that. So real good way to share knowledge and that. Our skill levels, you know, how do we increase our skill levels? A lot of it's behind the wheel. Just get in a truck and drive it. You know, listen to the uh, old timers giving you advice. You know, some places are real nice that they have simulators. 
You know, there's some states out there that have a simulator, has all these screens, and then you sit in like a driver's seat, and you operate a snowplow truck, and they throw curveballs at you. You know, what are you going to do if, you know, what if you drop the truck off the road? What if you have somebody go left to center? What are you going to do if the drift is so deep and you're going too fast and all of a sudden it throws you left to center? What are you going to do? So it, it's real nice uh, that they have those simulators. So and just picking up more skill out there. And then things to do before the season. So before all oh, the optimum route studies, I've talked a little about that. And I know ODOT has these computer programs and they're putting in every single county into this program to figure out how to get the most efficient route run in the county. Now, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I know in Dark County, they talk, we have a state route that runs from Greenville out to the state line, Indiana state line, and it stops. And the computer program says it's more efficient to have a truck drive out to the state line, pick their plow up and deadhead out back into Greenville. And then they deadhead a truck out to the state line and then plow back in. So sometimes the programs aren't the best, but they really do a good job of taking a look at things. And I don't know if you get a hold of Scott Lucas. Uh, he's our Clear Roads contact. If he'd be able to help you, you know, find out where one of those programs are, or I don't even know if LTAP offers this type service to the, you know, their their program to be able to let the municipalities and that be able to have access to a route to optimizing study. But it'll help you figure your cycle times out, your crew sizes, and that and it's a real good tool to have in your toolbox. Now, before the season, I hope everybody runs their routes. We do this, you know, we go out there and we're looking for hazards out there. Now, some things to look for, raised manhole covers, I don't know if any of you have hit a manhole cover, but man, that'll wake yourself up. It might jar a few teeth loose. I mean, we had one guy actually take the center of his plow blade out. You know, he, he had his uh, plow up traveling through an intersection and the, the manhole was up just a little bit and he clipped it with the center of the plow and just snapped the center of the plow blade right off. Looked like a buck tooth uh, plow blade. So of course we had to put a new plow blade on that. Had another guy, he was plowing over in uh, Union City, Ohio, and we're not supposed to have our plows down in that town, but he clipped the manhole and threw the manhole cover up into somebody's yard. So, you know, we're real fortunate there wasn't a car parked there, real fortunate that there wasn't a pedestrian walking by when he hit that. So be aware of where those manhole covers are. You know, we may not be able to run our plows down, I've had municipalities, they show me they have rubber blades on their plows, and they said, that's our manhole solution. They'll bounce over the uh, the manhole instead of pick off, break the blade, or uh, tear up the manhole itself. Curb drains. You would think that a curb drain would be flush. Uh, we've seen them raised a little bit. They stick out from the curbs. Be aware of where those are. You know, perfect world, they'd all be repaired before snow and ice season. But if you got a bad one, know where they're at, stay away from it with your plows so you don't tear up your plows. Concrete hazards. You know, we have the center islands out there at intersections and that. You know, wanna be careful of that. We had a guy actually bend the frame of his dump truck hitting one of these. Again, late at night and that, you know how we get pretty tired around four in the morning. He was coming in and, and it was his regular route. He hit one of these center islands, and he knew he hit it. You know, it was pretty obvious. Came back in, of course, went home. The next guy that came in to pre-trip the truck noticed that the plow frame was off. And our plow frames are mounted, bolted to the frame of the truck. And brought the mechanic out, and they got looking, and the plow frame was bent forward four inches. Got looking further. It wasn't the plow frame that was bent. It was the frame of the truck. So you can imagine what it took to fix that. Strip everything off the truck from the bed forward, send it out to a shop to heat it, heat up the frame, and then straighten it out and then bring it back to the shop. So again, it's better to see where these hazards are and prevent the accident from occurring, prevent all that cost and repairs and that. Head walls, I don't know if you folks still have head walls. At... Okay, Mom, I I'm sorry, I hit my that button. Yep, okay. I hit the mute button. I'm sorry about that, folks. So 
head walls. You know, I don't know if you guys still have them. Back when uh, the depression was going on in the 30s, they had the workers program, and part of that work was putting crossover pipes in on our state routes. You know, they built a lot of our bridges in that, and they put a head wall at the end of our pipes. So those head walls stuck up like a foot above ground level. And of course, over the years, we extended those uh, pipes out further. You know, we did uh, shoulder betterments, and those head walls kept getting closer and closer to the edge of the pavement. And one of our trucks hit one of those. Again, wee hours of the night. You didn't see it. It was blowing so much. They were buried under a pile of snow. And one of our guys caught it, brought the blade back, brought the plow back into the truck, into the um garage you know and he knew he hit something got out and went to look at it in the right hand side of the bottom right hand side bent back at a 90 degree angle and then almost all the welds that held the mold board onto the turntable of the plow were broken so totaled the plow out and we're fortunate we usually carry one or two spare plows at each county garage so we just switched over and got it operating went back out on the roadway but again there's all that expense into a brand new plow Road service defects out there, you know, be careful. Uh, full depth repairs, they put a hot mix patch in. Saw so in Greenville where they had done some full depth repair, put the patch in, and that patch, you know, from freezing and thawing, raised up out of the uh, um, pavement like two inches. Can you imagine hitting like a two foot square section of hot mix? It was two, two inches higher than the road pavement. Wow. You know, soft shoulders. I don't know if a lot of you do shoulder betterment projects. We do a lot of them. We're trying to do a runoff area for the traffic. We're also trying to do away with those steep drop-offs. We've rolled a few dump trucks. They drop a wheel off the roadway and over she goes. So those soft shoulders, you know, it takes about a year for them to, to set up. I'm sure all of you have seen the semis and that, the pull off on a shoulder that's just been put in and they're buried up to their axles. So be aware of where those areas are. Again, those steep drop-offs, you gotta know where those are. You get a good blowing wind out there and you, it's smooth out there. You can't see where those drop-offs are. You think, well, hey, I can go a little bit further off the road here and you drop off and you roll your truck. Guardrail, you know, know where your guardrail is. I've seen it buried under drifts before. So, and if you have wing plows, you know, when we first got wing plows at ODOT, we hit a lot of guardrail and mailboxes. So be careful, you know, know where those guardrails are. Low bridges. I'm sure that counties and townships, you've got a few bridges that are low. You know, you might get into them if you raise your bed to put material out. So know where those low bridges are. Expansion joints. I don't know if you guys got any killer expansion joints. I know we got a few in the state. We totaled out. Uh, two plows in one winter in Dark County on one uh, expansion joint. We ended up going out and taking crack sealing material and crack sealed the joints uh, and to get the plows to run over that expansion joint. Of course, we had to run our plows all the way over to the right so we didn't match up the angle of the plow with the expansion joint. And then we had plow shoes. We had to make sure they were in use because they were taking most of the weight of the plow blade off the roadway so they wouldn't drop into the expansion joint. So railroad tracks, you know, know where they are, know what type of railroad tracks. You know, we don't leave our plows down going across a set of tracks. We can get hung up in them. You know, not good when a train comes uh, through. Not good if your plow's angled enough that you can make contact with both rails. That drops the, the cross arms down on you. So we've had one truck that happened to. So again, and be careful of your plow types. Uh, the good old days, our plows had a uh, yoke with a chain that ran through it. And it was a balancing act just to pick our plow up and try to get it across the railroad track. Because whatever side was heavier, you hit a balance or something and that plow side would settle down. You know, I caught a set of railroad tracks, double set of tracks, picked my plow up, hit the first set of tracks, bounced, dropped my left-hand side of the plow, and clipped the second set of railroad tracks, stopped me cold. I had a manual transmission. I had to restart the truck, get the plow balanced, and get in, and get across the, the railroad tracks. So be aware of railroad tracks. Trees. 
again, hopefully everybody clears out their trees so trucks can get through. I know a lot of the cities and counties, townships, don't do that on their side roads and that because they aren't uh, set up for trucks, right? You don't allow trucks on them. But if you take a snow and ice truck through there, you need to have clearances. If you pick the bed up, you need to have those clearances. So, and remember with heavy snow, it'll take those limbs and bend them down towards the roadway. So be careful of that. Park vehicles. You know, I hear from municipalities when I go out and do these classes that those mirrors on those vehicles just love to jump out in front of a snowplow and get hit. So be careful of that. You know, salt restriction areas. I don't know if any of you have salt sensitive areas out there. I think the state may have one or two areas that we have to be very careful on putting salt down because we have like evergreen or Christmas tree farms up along the roadway. And we have to be careful of those um, uh, areas. I know someplace in the state, we had a Christmas tree farm and of course we're throwing snow off the roadway and we killed the first row or the first and second row of the Christmas trees. We had to pay and buy two rows of Christmas trees. And I think they restricted the salt usage in that area to make sure we didn't do it again. So other things out there we need to look for, you know, the, the type of environment. You know, for in-city, you know, we might have a higher traffic volume. So we need to make sure the roads are clear to get them through. We also have to be aware that it's a higher hazard for us because the more vehicles we have around us, then the higher risk we have for an accident. You know, suburban, not quite urban, not quite rural out there, you know, housing developments and that. You know, be aware of your traffic, you know, your intersections and everything. Rural, where we have less people out there, it might be more open space, higher risk for blow-ins and that, uh, higher risk of people maybe getting stuck out there on your roadways. Cross slopes. Again, it'd be nice if all our roads had a, a crown in the middle, but not of them do. You know, you're going through a transitional area and you have different sloping areas in that. You know, be aware of that so you can treat them accordingly. You know, so you don't end up with a slick spot in a certain area there, high risk for accidents and that. Weaving areas, on and off ramps, merging areas. They get high risk of accidents in those areas. You want to give them special attention. Narrowings, you know, you might have a two lane road and all of a sudden it goes down to a one lane road. Or you have a one lane road with a four foot paved berm and it goes down to a two foot. You know, you want to know where those are, especially if you're running a plow. You don't want to run your plow off into the dirt, you know, and start throwing sod out the end of your plow. You know, pavement surface types. You know, it, we have one municipality that said they had a drop off area, and they're not for sure why the architect did it, but they had a washed rock surface, which means you can see all the rocks on the surface. And they said they could never get that area clear with salt. They ended up having to go to a salt brine treatment. So it got down in between all the little rocks so it would clear out the area. So be careful of surface type treatments. You might have to do a specialized treatment there um, in, just in case, you know, if, if it won't clear off in that. Be aware of solar influences. In other words, you have wooded areas, forest and that to grow up over the roadway and shade it. You know, you might have to give that roadway more attention. It might be at a higher risk for frosting, black ice forming. You know, building structures can also shade that area. So be aware of where those areas are. You know, a cut where the roadway runs below the level of the ground around it. You know, again, high risk maybe for blowing snow, high risk for uh, black ice, maybe a higher risk for uh, drifting in. So other things out there we might have. So over the years, I've had people talk about horse and buggies. And we have a lot of horse and buggies in the state of Ohio. And those horses don't like plows. You know, we've had one county say they had the old strobe light type uh, flashers. They'd have to shut those off. You know, otherwise it'd spook horses. We've had others say they have actually had to shut their trucks down, walk out, grab the horse by the bridle, get it past the truck so they could continue plowing. Had other people tell me the horses can feel the vibration of the plow on the pavement through their hooves. And more than once they've seen horse and buggy and the operator going across fields. So fire hydrants, you know, know where they're at. You know, they can get buried in drifts in that. Telephone poles, uh, not telephone poles, telephone pedestals. Those little uh, 
pedestals, they do all the junctions with buried phone lines, especially if you got to push back at intersections and that and clean those out, know where those pedestals are. You know, we seem to take one or two off every year when we're pushing snow back. So photo here in this slide, it's the only one I found. I had the guys tell me about this, but before we had hydraulic systems, we had this big drive chain that ran from the right rear axle to the auger. And that's how they put material down. You know, no safety cage or anything around that uh, chain, but that's how they uh, put salt down. I thought it was a unique technique. Wanted to share that with everyone. So our responsibilities boil down to three things. And we're gonna look at each of these in a little bit more detail, you know, and it breaks down into plowing, anti-icing, and de-icing. Now the photo here is game plowing. I don't know if it's around here in Columbus and that. I did this once. They put me in the middle of the pack and it, it's an interesting experience to go out and gang plow like this. We're cleaning the uh, dividing wall in there. And of course you see two dump trucks having to clean out the, uh, the wall. There's so much material packed in. And then we're taking about a half bite as we go down through. No wings are being used in that. And then we're, we're pushing a full plow off the side of the road. And we usually have two pickup trucks running behind to block the traffic. You know, if you're running interstate systems, they all have to drive 70 mile an hour, no matter what the road conditions are. And they got to get between us. You know, they want to get on gone. And, you know, we've seen vehicles come in, try to go through three foot of snow. You know, we shake our heads. And I, there's been some uh, choice words said on the state radios as we communicate and that between the trucks. But, you know, some of the advice I was given is give me enough room between each of the trucks that if somebody gets loose, we don't tangle, you know, and make sure no one could get in between you. Stay on the radio and listen to what's going on. You know, and then we have two trucks all the way in the rear that clean out the ramps because we put three foot of snow across an off ramp. Nobody can get off, or at least uh, we think they can't get off. I mean, we had one guy in a van thought he could get off, and he, he tried to go off through this stuff, went up on all fours and just sat there and spin. You know, what can we do? Two trucks went around him and kept right on going. So let's look at these. Plowing. You know, we're going to put a plow on. Maybe we're not going to put a plow on. I learned here in Columbus that interstate, they didn't like to run with plows because we run pretty fast. We're running about 40 mile an hour on the interstate. And we don't want to, you know, if we run at 25 or so, we're going to get ran over. So we don't run with the plows. They consider them a secondary hazard out there. And a lot of times we're putting enough material down to keep the roads wet so we don't have material to plow off. You know, I always liked them back in Dark County because I thought it helped stabilize the vehicle. I also thought there was more protection for me as an operator because they had to go through the plow before they got to me if there was a head on. So recommended plowing speed, 25 mile an hour. So there's manufacturers that actually put decals on their plows that say 25 mile an hour. Now, all of you are running diesels, right? Did you know you have those regenerating exhaust systems on them, you know, to keep the environment clean? We learned the hard way that we had to maintain our RPMs at 1500 or higher, because if we lugged the engine, it would clog those systems up and then they had to come up with a way to clean them out. So something to keep in mind. Again, speeds can change on plowing with operational needs. I mentioned the interstate problems we're having, but every time we go faster, you know, that's a higher <laughs> risk of damaging our equipment, our snow plows in particular. You know, again, I want to credit Licking County engineers for this uh, photo. I think they're the county engineer that put this up. You know, their their policy is 15 to 20 mile an hour. You know, at 25 mile an hour, they come up, it doubles the risk of damaging your plow. 34 times the risk, 35, eight times the risk at 40 mile per hour, total destruction of the plow. You get into some. So the slower you go with plowing, the better off you are. You know, you find that sweet spot. With my trucks, I can lock the gear, uh, the automatic transmission down a gear, out of drive, and they keep my RPMs up. And I, my sweet spot was usually about 22 mile an hour plowing out there. Again, basics on plowing, we plow the center out. We want to get the snow from the center of the roadway so it doesn't melt and run downhill. You know, we don't want the windrows here for traffic to hit and lose control of their vehicle. 
we plow back as the storm permits. If you have wing plows on your truck, you plow the center out and plow back at the same time. They're a great tool for us to use out there. You know, great cost savings out there. Get more work done with less people, less time involved. So watching for obstacles. Again, be aware of that bed uh, height overpasses. We're not supposed to throw snow over overpasses. You know, the railroads, you know, we had somebody from the railroad tell us this. Oh, we can derail a train. You throw too much snow over and throw it on the railroad tracks. Never seen that happen, and I don't know the rationale behind it. Uh, the EPA and that don't like us throwing snow into waterways because we're throwing salt and everything else in there. You know, if there's a road underneath of it, you know, what's going to happen if you throw snow over? One of our stories here in Columbus, we had a newbie plowing the outer uh, belt, 275 going around uh, Columbus, and they went over the overpass that had uh, 40 going underneath of it. And there's a traffic light, and yet all this traffic stopped for the traffic light. And out of nowhere, a foot of snow appears on their hoods. And in Columbus, they make phone calls when things like that ha happen. You know, not good to hit other people with that winged row or the uh, rooster tail coming off of the end of your plow. So be careful of them overpasses. And again, we're trying to move all that snow to the low side of the roadway, you know, low side of the ramps, because if it melts, it won't run across the roadway that way. Be careful of where you stockpile your snow, especially the intersections and driveways. You know, we can create blind spots. You know, after the storm, we may have to go in and clean out intersections or push the snow back out just to maintain our sight distances there so we don't have accidents at those intersections. And again, if the wind starts blowing, we start get drifting snow, those piled up snow areas will be a starting point for snow drifts. So things to be aware of when plowing, you know, deep snow drifts can throw our trucks you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Everybody that plows snow knows that when we're throwing snow out the right-hand side, it feels like it's pushing us off to the left. You know, I've only had it happen once where I've gotten into too deep of a snow drift, and it's thrown me left to center. So very fortunate nobody else was coming. Uh, some of it had to do, I was going a little bit too fast. I was doing uh, blow-ins or fingers out on our state route. And one came up a little bit too soon, dropped the plow, and I was going too fast, threw me all the way off the left-hand side. So, and, and be careful of that. I mean, we've got operators out there. It seems like we got to go out every storm and pull them out of the ditch because they're plowing too fast. You know, they get blown off the other side of the roadway. You know, we had one guy who said, I was only doing 20 mile an hour, but he was all the way down at the right-of-way fence. And you don't end up down there, you know, plowing at 20 mile an hour. So vehicles can be buried in drifts. Uh, back when we had really bad storms in that, you know, I was cleanup guy behind a V-blade with a grader. And we went through a section of roadway that we were lucky, it had one lane open, that was all they could get. And next thing you know, you know, the operator and the grader cuts on the radio and said, hey, there's a car here. And by gosh, we had a car buried all the way down in the drift and we had to work our way around that and end up having the tow truck come out and get it out of the way so we can get the road open. Snow forts, kids, all you cities and that, I've heard two stories, you know, of kids playing in snow forts. Uh, there's actually some good public education uh, on YouTube and that. There's a lady snow plow operator that uh, there's a video and it shows her coming up on a snow fort. She sees the uh, sled in that outside, gets out and has a talk with the kids and then plows the snow fort off of the off the street area. So, you know, one of the other stories is we had a guy clean out a cul-de-sac and their policy was they push all the snow up into the residents' yards in between the driveways and he dropped the plow and all of a sudden two heads popped out of the drift and he was getting ready to push back. You know, they had their snow fort set there. You know, had another guy that was plowing back. You have the primary lane. There was two lanes going each way, primary lane, the secondary, the right-hand lane, and he was going through trying to get that cleared out. And the kids heard the plow coming down the road and they stepped back out of the fort. But, uh, you know, it could have got somebody that way. And both those guys remember every time they go through that area, they remember what happened there. Keeping drains open. Real important to keep our drainage structures open so when the snow starts to melt, the water runs, you know, into the drainage structure. 
you know, one of my stories, part of the, uh, the area I took care of here in Columbus was Don Scott Airport. ODOT has an aviation department and the governor's plane and other dignitaries, uh, their, their aircraft are there at Don Scott Airport. We have a parking lot. So we had to go in there and push out the parking lot. And I was told you will stockpile your snow in this area and you will not stockpile any in the parking lot because they had somebody go in and stockpile it over the only drain in the parking lot. So you can imagine when the snow started melting and there was no draining structure open and you had a flood there. You know, you had an inch or so of water standing in the parking lot. Blow-ins, you know, at times blow-ins can be a touchy subject with people. You know, do you treat them? Do you not treat them? You know, if the road's dry and it's blown across, you don't treat them. So, you know, if it's slicking up there, you don't have a choice. You got to throw something down on them. And, and you, once you do it, it's job security. You know, you got to keep them wet, otherwise they'll uh, freeze over. You know, some of the tricks we've learned, you know, we have a wing plow on our truck. We're going to push the upwind side as far off the road as we can. We've had some counties with salt brine uh, sprayers. You know, the inserts in that, they've got a sidebar on it and they're spraying the upwind side of that drift area to hopefully stop all the snow blowing across the road enough that they can get the road cleaned up and froze dry, and then the, the snow will start blowing again. So identify your trouble spots out on your routes in that. You know, your chronic blowing areas, they may need special treatment, they may need snow fencing, and that your chronic icing spots know where those areas are you're going to have to keep an eye on those keep them treated well you know some of the areas may just throw grits down on them for traction intersections we'll see a little bit later that half of all our accidents occur at intersections so we want to keep those areas clear you know hills people can't break coming down people can't get up the hill so we'll want to keep an eye on those and curves again people don't allow slowing down enough to get around the curve high elevation curves, you know, be aware of that. We had one of our snow trucks in Dark County slide out of a high elevation curve. You know, they had a semi with full of gas in the bottom of the curve stuck because they couldn't get around. And our guy was trying to get around on the high side and he still slid out and tangled with the gas truck down below. So be careful of curves in that. So again, I've talked about not leaving windrows on the roadway. Try to empty your plow out before going through intersections. You know, they're telling us like bridges and that, that you empty your plow out and then you turn your plow straight and go on across and then dump it out on the other side of the bridge or the intersection. So things to be aware of, you know, up close to the road, vehicles, again, throwing snow into vehicles or clipping that, that rear view mirror. Buildings, be aware of how close they are. We had one in Dark County where the old time shops seemed to be built right up against the edge of the roadway. And this one had two garage doors for the vehicle repair shop side of it, all glass in them. You know, they had like three different rows of glass panels. One of our new guys went through with a great big rooster tail coming off the side of it, blew it right through the glass on those. We had to pay to replace all that glass. So I had another complaint that uh, not for sure which plow operator was doing it, but they were plowing down one road and they loved watching that rooster tail come off. And we got a complaint because somebody was on the second floor of their house looking out the window, snow plow went by and all this snow ended up on the roof of their front porch. Sidewalks, again, business isn't out, out there. They wanna stay open for business. So they wanna keep their sidewalks clear. Not a good idea to drive by and load up their sidewalks with snow. Bus stop. People are trying to get to and from, you know, to work. They're trying to get from work. They're trying to get to the stores and that. Not a good idea to go by there and load up a bus stop with snow or to hit the pedestrians, the people standing there, you know, and people walking down the street. No, not a good idea to clip them with a rooster tail, right? And I'm sure we've seen some videos online of that happening. You know, sometimes it's funny, most of the time it's not. So any icing. So that's going out before the storm and it's a proactive measure in snow and ice fighting. You know, we're trying to keep the material from bonding to the pavement. You know, it's been going on for 15 years now, maybe a little bit longer than that. 
So we apply it to troubled areas out there, our bridges and that. They tell us by putting the salt down on that, that we can get about a 45 minute window before we have to get out there and hit the road. But there are studies out there. There's one where they had a, a stretch of roadway that was uh, black icing on a regular basis. They were running almost a thousand accidents a year on this stretch of road. They go out and anti-ice or pre-treat is another term for it. And that accident rate went down to less than 10 a year. So there's phenomenal results by going out and doing anti-icing. We're also reducing our salt usage by up to a factor of four, according to some studies, because we're not fighting the bond uh, of the snow net to the pavement. So, and then the way the study says it increases the efficient use of salt reduced and minimizes that, again, environmental concerns, because if we use four times as less salt, you know, we're not putting that salt down into the environment. And again, the studies show that we can reduce snow and ice fighting cost by as much as 90% for that one storm. Again, that can be seen in less overtime cost, less operator fatigue, because they're not pulling lots of hours to get the roads clear. And again, it's a little bit safer working condition because the roads aren't ice packed and that we prevented that bond from occurring. Again, we get the roads back to normal faster you know, that's la less labor in doing that, less material, less environmental impact, you know, and we're reducing the accidents and the delays out there because we prevented that bond from occurring. And again, if you're using uh, grits out there, we're putting less dust in that into the air as well as salt particles. Again, that's that environmental impact. So by using brine, it sticks to the road surface it doesn't blow off of it easily. You know, it's more an efficient use of materials. Again, we can blend our own formula into that brine and the carbs is sugars, which helps make the brine sticky. You know, it'll stick to the road way longer. You know, interstates we're seeing about three days. You get onto the rural roads, we can see, you know, up to a week of that brine sticking to the roadway. So, and again, it starts working as soon as we have that snow hitting the pavement. So de-icing, again, that's reactive to snow and ice. That means that bond is formed. We're trying to get that bond broken, trying to get all that snow um, off the roadway. How do we do that? We apply chemicals to the roadway. Now, usually it's salt. You know, we put salt down, we're gonna apply it to the high side of the road, the crown of the road. So when it goes from rock salt to a salt brine, it then runs downhill. So we want you to apply it with a low spinner speed so that uh, it doesn't scatter. You know, the more concentrated the salt is, the better effect it's going to have. You know, a lot of times we run our spinners at the lowest speed so it just drops off the edges of it. You know, if we're on interstate, the tandem trucks and that, we usually spread to the width of the truck because we're trying to treat three lanes at one time. And to get that spread, that's, that's what we gotta do. And what's real nice is once we drop it into that center lane, the traffic will work it between the other two lanes. So they really help us, you know, the more traffic they say, the better the salt and that works out there because they, they work it into the pavement, they move materials around uh, so it'll melt the road or melt the salt a lot faster. Pre-wetting. Big thing uh, everybody's doing, I think, now. Again, there's several different ways to pre-wet. You know, the stockpile. You know, I've seen counties where they bring in uh, beet juice, they bring a pug mill in, and they treat all their salt, throw it up into the bin, and then they um, put it out on the roadway. So ODOT, we usually do it at the spinner. Again, part of the idea of doing it at the spinners, we're not putting the corrosive materials into the bed of the truck. You know, so we protect the truck, get a longer service life out of it, and it hits the spinner, it hits the material, and right on the roadway. Again, because we're wetting the salt net, it makes it sticky, and it sticks to the roadway rather than bouncing off the edges of the roadway. So, you know, we see a lot better return on investment by pre-wetting. You know, other ways you can pre-wet, I've seen... Um, if you're wetting at the loader bucket, they get a scoop of material, put it under a spray bar, spray the loader bucket for like five seconds and then dump it on the dump truck. You know, I've seen other groups that uh, 
just pre-wet their entire load. They throw it on the back of their dump truck, pull it under a spray bar, saturate the back for, I don't know, 20 seconds, and off on the roadway you go. And that's usually the cheapest way. I've had a couple of uh, facilities ask me, how do we get into pre-wetting? And if they don't want to retrofit their equipment with a spinner pre-wetter, uh, some of them are going with the uh, spray bar over the entire load. It gets their foot in the door, and then as their budgets allow, they can get into uh, you know retrofitting each of the pieces of equipment with a uh, pre-wetter at the spinner. So, and one of the other ways to do it, if you look at the uh, photo on this slide, that is a Swanson insert hopper for a single axle truck. I took it uh, City of Sandusky, and you see the two augers between it, you see the uh, pre-wetting pipe. They, they pre-wet at the auger, and I've seen another garage that had the pre-wetting in the auger itself, where they run the salt brine through the auger. So a lot of different techniques in pre-wetting out there. Slurry mixes, it's an up and coming uh, technique. They're actually taking rock salt and then on the back of their trucks, they have uh, a, a mill, they call them roller mills, basically two steel drums that crush the rock salt into fine powder. And then they mix 30 to 60 gallons of brine uh, per ton of rock salt. And it turns it into a paste. Everybody describes it like toothpaste but it's immediately active as soon as it hits the roadway. 100% of it stays on the roadway, very effective use of materials in that. And then the study said it's incredibly effective in normal winter maintenance operations that have resulted in substantial increases in performance, but they never defined what that meant. So I'm not aware of anyone at ODOT using the slurry mix yet. Uh, I'm sure they're gonna play with it, uh, sometime in the future, but the clear road states that are using it, like I said, they're, they're swearing by the slurry mix. And then direct liquid application out there. We're flooding the roadway during a snow and ice operation with a blended brine or a straight salt brine mixture. I'm sure all of you have seen our semis out there. You know, in District 7, when I worked there, the only two semis we had were at the district and they had drop decks on the back and all they did was haul equipment around. So nowadays we're seeing county garages with at least two semis tankers that go out and treat interstate routes. You know, they're running a two hour round and they flood the roadways with brine. And again, it, it's a good return on investment because you're using less material, immediately active when it hits the roadway. And, and it just works out good. We may end up blending something into it, beet heat, or uh, aqua salina seem to be the two items we blend in. We still use some calcium chloride out there on the roadway. I think there's been a shift away from calcium chloride because it eats the trucks up. So blended brines, I've seen 70-30 uh, blend. Uh, I think that's what Beat Heat recommends. I've seen it down to 90-10 blend before. 80-20 blend is also a common blend out there. And then the chart there is our current direct liquid application uh, chart that we have for when we're putting it down out on our roadway. So some national statistics out there. So 70% of our nation's roads are in the snow and ice region. That means we're getting five inches uh, of snow a year in those areas. Now we're seeing 117,000 people injured in those snowy conditions. 1,300 fatalities each year. So road salting can reduce injuries and crash accidents by cost by up to 88%. You know, studies show that we're paying for our de-icing operations within the first 25 minutes of application, which is through accident reductions, keeping the economy going. So here in Ohio, we carry the fifth largest volume of traffic in the U.S. You know, they're saying 1.3 trillion of freight crosses Ohio yearly. I've been told we have a billion dollars in freight on our roadways at any one time. You know, 33,664 snow and ice related accidents, 9,063 injuries, and then around 53 fatalities a year for snow and ice. Again, very important for us to get out there to get the roadways clear, 
and try to reduce those accidents and that out there. And this is out of the Salt Institute uh, Snow Finders chart. It actually shows part of the study that they did to prove that we can reduce accidents by 88% within the first 45 minutes, first hour of snow and ice operations. So every snowfall throughout the state, again, I don't know where everybody is, it's throughout the state. So again, we got the uh, lake effect snow up there in Cuyahoga County. And the guys up there tell me that when they get lake effect snow, they're running three eight hour shifts 24 seven till the storm is done. Then we have the opposite all the way at the bottom, less than 20 inches of snow a year. Um, I've had some municipalities down there tell me they buy the ODOT equipment down there because it looks like it's hardly ever used. You know, less than 20 inches a year, it doesn't get down the road that much. So when we sell off our equipment, we're trying to get 15 years of service out of it. And it looks in real good condition. I had one garage down there that said they couldn't buy the bed off the truck for what they bought the entire truck for. And they had, I think, four of our old ODOT units down there. So that might be a good source for the townships and that to find newer equipment than what they're currently running at a really good price. So at this time, I want to see if anyone has any questions over the first section. You know, Ron, uh, they don't have questions, but we do have a couple of comments that came in from okay. Kim Reisner, who's up in District 2. She said, we have gone from beet heat and calcium to apex C. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. Okay, and I don't know what apex C is. So, and hopefully everybody um, has seen that where District 2 is gone from calcium and beet heat to apex C. So that's just a product I am not familiar with. Okay. There's a, um, a question that just came in. It says, what do you mean by plowback? Okay, what do I mean by plowback? And again, once we get the road area clear, the, the paved area, the paved berm, uh, we'll push, we'll take our wing plows and we'll push back off the roadway so we've got space for snow to store you know during the storm you know we want to make sure that our sight lines are clear at intersections and that and then plow back also includes clearing all the mailboxes on the state routes our secondary state routes so does that answer the questions victoria yep we're good okay we're good so we're going to move into lesson two so I'm gonna get a swig of Diet Pepsi here. I gotta keep my whistle wet or otherwise I can't talk. We have to thank everyone for hanging in here for a second. This is actually Ron's first time presenting on a webinar. So I coached him through how to mute everything. So he'd be able to get a, a drink while he was still presenting and not have all of us listen to it, so. <laughs> thank you very much, Victoria. So anyway, this slide, is again our, one of our dry runs you know every fall i think they call them readiness inspections nowadays but every year we line all our equipment and have mechanics out of district come down go through all our equipment make sure we're ready for the snow and ice season so my first truck in the background there you see an old ford dump truck and i want to say mine was a 73 ford it was one of the few at that time that had an automatic transmission in it so Back then, the, the trucks were not in the best of condition. I know my truck had to put sign plates screwed to the floor and then a new um, all-weather carpet down just to keep my feet wet and, or keep my feet dry and warm during the winter season. And then you notice there's a box on top of the cabs. Well, what that is, is that's the first generation truck radio. Back then they had tubes in them and they were so big they couldn't fit them in the cabs of the dump trucks. So their solution was to mount the radios on the tops of the trucks. You know, when I came to work, we had transitioned to solid state. So those had moved to the inside of the dump trucks. But again, it's another nice piece of history there. Oh, I gotta click off. There we go. So I can go to the next one. So with us pre-trip inspections, very important for us to be doing this. I really hope that everybody that has CDL vehicles and you have a CDL license, that you are doing a documented CDL pre-trip. 
So we'll see some of ours in the next few slides. You know, with us doing pre-trips, we come in before a storm, we pre-trip the equipment, takes us about 15 minutes when we're familiar with the equipment. If we're not familiar, maybe a little bit longer. Again, we wanna catch the small problems before they become big problems. You know, we break a truck down out on the interstate or out on the roadways, we normally have to call a tow truck, which can be a thousand dollar tow to get our truck back to the shop to fix. So it's a whole lot smarter to take care of it at the shop during inspections. You know, we do our pre-trip, you know, we fill our form out, we go talk to a mechanic if we have issues and there's things that as an operator I can do, you know, I might be able to switch out a tail light or something. Used to be able to switch tires and now I can assist a mechanic to switch tires. But the mechanic will say, yeah, we can do this, we can do that, that can wait, I'll get in on my list of things to do. Or if they, they come out and look at the equipment and say, hey, yeah, we got to down it. You have both of you tell the supervisor that the equipment is down. So when we do it, we have to do it at the beginning of our shift, you know, if we're running an eight hour shift, a 12 hour shift, 16 hour shift, and it's good for the entire shift. So yeah, again, we do it, again, reducing cost. And then um, on these, let's see. Oh, okay, my note here, I can barely see. I don't know if I can move my bar. Yeah, I can move it so I can read my note. So District 7 gave me a notice that there's 7,400 series internationals. The engines in them uh, have a design flaw and they were losing them left and right because the cylinder liner height was wrong. And it lets uh, the head gaskets leak I don't know if anyone still has those trucks. I had one facility say as soon as they found the problem, they sold off their entire fleet of that truck. Um, you know, with us, we're trying to get that 15 years out of our equipment. And I think we were billed and put in it and the manufacturer will not stand behind the default. And I was told at one point that International went to an entirely different engine because of the problem. So this is our ODOT pre-trip sheet. Again, this is one of our handouts, and I believe it's on our LTAP website if you want to download these. People really like these because they have snow and ice equipment as part of our pre-trip. Again, ODOT learned their lesson uh, sort of the hard way. Attorneys, you know, dictate a lot of our policies and procedures, and we were never doing these pre-trips and we had an accident in the state, they wanted to know where our pre-trip was, that we don't have it, and we got cited for it, and the attorney representing the person we had the accident with basically took it to the bank. You know, so ODOT came out with a single page pre-trip, and when we filled it out, we had to turn it into the mechanics. We had another accident somewhere in the state, and they wanted to know where your pre-trip was. Well, it was back in the mechanics bay. Well, it has to be in the truck. You know, the attorney took that one to the bank. UDOC came out with a, a spiral bound pre-trip binder. You know, it has the primary uh, white page and then a yellow copy page, press through copy. So when we filled them out, we ripped the, the primary page and gave that to the mechanic when we talked to him about issues with the truck. And he had a copy to review and comment on. And then um, we would have the spiral bound to take out on the roadway. So, and they really like that because they can prove a history you know, that we're doing these pre-trips. And whenever we uh, get done with that spiral bound, I understand they hold them in file for a while. You know, up to two years, I've heard one person say, uh, just in case we do have a lawsuit out there on the road, and that because usually they don't file it the day after an accident, they file it two years down the road. Uh, there's a two year time limit on when they can file it. And the day before that two year limit up is when those those get filed. You know, I've talked to municipalities that don't do these documented pre-trips and it's like they're setting themselves up for a lawsuit sometime in the future. You know, one guy said, well, as long as we don't get caught, we're okay, but it's the paycheck you're gonna pay out if you do get caught. So real good there. And then we use these for the post inspection. We put our end miles, end hours and everything as well. If we're hauling a trailer on it, if we have any comments, we can put those in. We put material use on these. And I've seen, uh, I saw one county engineer, I actually got copies, but I can't hand them out during this class or pass it around. But he has all his paperwork that all his operators have to do on the bottom half of their pre-trip. 
So everybody can come up with their own version of it, but those garages and that that don't have it, this is a lot better than going to a truck stop, getting their truck stop pre-trips and using that. So, and again, ODOT thought it was so good to have a pre-trip for CDL vehicles. They said, we got to do this for all our heavy equipment. So they did it for their heavy equipment. Again, we're catching the big problems before they become little problems out there on the roadway. So and this is for tracked wheeled vehicles, you know, very comprehensive. And again, this should be one of the handouts in there. So real easy to fill out in that. Definitely recommended because again, they like it because they're in spiral bound and they can, if we do something on the road, we can bring that pre-trip into the mechanic at the end of the shift so they're aware of stuff. And they like showing a history that we're doing uh, daily pre-trips at the beginning of every shift. And this, this one is the non-CDL pre-trip sheet. And this is a, it's a half sheet, so that's why you have two per page, so you print it out, cut it in two. And these are in a spiral bound as well so we can keep it with the vehicle. So we have a pre-trip sheet for about everything. And this is just vehicles. This doesn't include aerial lifts and everything. We got pre-trips for about everything, I think, in ODOT. So during the operation out there on the roadway, again, this picture, good old days, the radio on top of the truck, looks like they got a snowstorm in progress by the looks of it. And all the safety equipment back in the day we had to have in the truck. You know, set of tire chains, a log chain to haul people out with, you know, some sort of um, traffic control. Then we had uh, flares, you know, bad, this is real old time because they had the kerosene flares. Now we had the reflectors or the road fuses in there and then our triangles in there. And then hard hat, safety vest, not for sure what the thing is under the stop sign. But we had to do that every year and be inspected, plus a whistle and all that. So when we're out on the road, you know, check our vehicle each time we get out. You know, it's nice. Our routes, we run about 20 miles on each route. You know, there's a turnaround point. We can hop out, walk around the truck, make sure our uh, taillights and that are clear and that. Look for hydraulic leaks. You know, the O-rings like the leak on our hydraulic fittings. Sometimes you get a lot of pressure in our system uh, and we'll blow a hose. You know, I've blown hydraulic lines. I've had the O-cylinders go out. So do a walk around and check your vehicles. Again, we're going to monitor our gauges as we drive down through um, the roadway. You know, our oil pressure drops out. We need to get it in the shop, figure out what's going on. You know, one of my stories is I came here, I, I ran from Greenville and the Columbus to pick up a piece of equipment. And I was noticing my alternator gauge was going down, 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 down. Pulled into a roadside rest before the engine cocked out on me and called it in and they came out and looked at it. They had a mechanic come out from Columbus, had to charge my batteries up, said my alternator blew out. And they said, the way this truck was set up, all it showed you was my charge on the uh, batteries. And they said, it was smart that you pulled into the roadside rest and diagnosed the problem rather than having the engine die out on the roadway. Because again, all our vehicles run on computers. Once you lose battery, you have no engine. It just stops running. So, and it can be anywhere. So, and again, we're trying to keep the cost down. So with ODOT, you know, we have a tendency of burning up trucks. And this just happens to be one of them. Uh, we had a, a bad oil cooler. And this is one of the trucks that just happened to burn up from it. Again, they, they got the problem fixed in that, but be aware of it. You know, look under your hood when you do your pre-trip. You know, look for all your leaks in that. Try to catch those little problems before they become big problems or total out of the entire truck. Now, one of the other problems when we do our pre-trips, we got to lift our beds up if they don't have a load in it or no hopper. These are single axle trucks and we have to look at our lift mechanism. You can see on this slide where the main pin that holds the lift cylinder is walking out. I'll go to the next slide and it shows where the top of the bolt is routed off. And again, it might be after 10 years of service that this occurred. But can you imagine what had happened if that pin came all the way out? What would have happened to the dump truck? Bed up, full load in the back, you know, flip it over backwards. How are you going to clean that mess up out on the roadway? So a whole lot better to catch it in the shop rather than out on the road. So tires, again, we've lost them. 
before we found uh, when we first mounted our wing plows on the front right side, the rims weren't rated for the weight. So we cracked an awful lot of the front right rims out. So if you notice, almost all our wing plows are mounted either mid frame or between the rear duals on our dump trucks. So we do it as part of our inspection, we check between the lug nuts and that for any cracks in that. Let's see, next slide shows us a simple solution, the lug nut indicator flag. So, you know, you torque down. Uh, again, I was saying I wasn't allowed to change tires anymore. Nowadays, we assist a mechanic and they take the tire off, put it back on. When they put it on, they have to torque every one of those lug nuts to whatever the foot pounds is. And then at that time, we'll put one of these lug nut indicators on each one. And everybody remembers, lefty loosey, right? So this comes loose, it's going to flag it. Real simple way to know when your lug nuts come loose. And then we check in between each of them for cracking, which is the, the common thing to happen on these uh, rims. So after operations, again, fueling, even during the storm, we want to keep our fuel tanks half full. You know, some of the garages, I've had some of the guys, oh, we don't get more than 10 minutes away from the shop. So we're not worried if we get down, you know, lower quarter tank. And that's your operation. You know it better than I do. You know, but like in Dark County, we have some areas that are out in no man's land. You know, we want a half a tank of fuel. So if we get stuck, we can live in the truck for a while. You know, stay warm in the truck. Washer fluid. You know, my old 96 International, I think my coffee cup, held more uh, coffee than what my windshield washer fluid held. So we always have a gallon jug in our trucks just to make sure we got enough windshield washer fluid. You know, nowadays I've seen gallon, gallon and a half, two gallon windshield washer fluid uh, reservoirs. If you feel comfortable with that, that's fine. But it's not good to get out on your route, you know, especially when you're plowing back, you get all that slushy stuff coming up on the windshield. And you end up running the wipers and the fluid all the time and you're out and you're out in the middle of nowhere, what do you do? You know, you throw snow on the windshield, you know, or you stop at the closest gas station, you buy a gallon of windshield washer fluid to get you back to the shop. So we'll look at plow wear a little bit later. Again, keeping the truck inside and out, that's one of our pet peeves. You know, that's our office 16 hours a day. We want it clean, especially if it's our assigned truck. You know, we had back in the day, we had guys that chewed tobacco and they just spit on the floorboards of the truck or they spit out the window and they'd run down the side of the truck. And then good old days, our door handles were at the top of the door rather than the bottom. You go to grab that door handle and you have chewing tobacco all over. You know, and then they had those spittoons. They spit into a pop bottle or they um, had a coffee cup with a paper towel in it. They leave those things in the truck. You know, you get in this like, ew, and clean things up. Uh, had a guy that um, I always kept a coffee can. Back when they had metal coffee cans, I kept one full of hard candy to snack on. And we had a guy, the running gag was to keep your hand, hands back when you eat lunch because he'll eat everything he can get his hands on. And he cleaned out my coffee can of candy, but there was wrappers all over the inside of the truck. You know, it's like, have some decency to clean it out. And then you had sunflower seed guys. You know, they chew on sunflower seeds and all the shelves for the sunflower seeds are all over the inside of the truck. Get an air hose out or a shop vac to clean all them things out. Uh, keep your vehicles clean. So washing. Again, we sort of learned the hard way with this. We burned a number of trucks up. We burned uh, an outpost up. And I don't know if you know what the J clips are, but we have all these computers in our trucks. You have all these electronic wires running all over the place. And those clips that go between the uh, the components, the electrical components are J clips. They're rated for 40 PSI. We're washing our trucks with power washers, putting 1200 PSI out. What do you think we did to those J clips? We forced all the chemicals that we use in snow and ice control into those clips. It rotted, caused shorts. You know, if we're lucky, all it did was melt the wires. You know, but we've had trucks burn up. You know, it'd take a truck or two with it, you know, or it might take an outpost with it. You know, we actually had to retrofit at that time all our trucks with a battery disconnect switch to turn off at the end of the shift to make sure we didn't burn our vehicles up. So our lesson learned was garden hose. 
use a garden hose around anything electronic. We can use the pressure washer on the external components of the truck. Hopefully no one's had that happen. I did have a county garage or city garage lose a truck inside the shop. It burned inside. They were able to get the other two trucks out. I want to say it was last year. It was like the day before I showed up to do this class. And you know what was left of it was all set in there. And they, they assumed it was an international model, which is known for this. And they, they were pretty sure that's what happened to it. Greasing the truck in that. It, what we did in our county, you know, we used to shut the whole garage down, the end of a snow and ice event. We go through and clean our equipment, get it all ready for the next snow and ice storm. And again, to be more productive, you know, we had a dedicated crew assigned to do washing. So half the fleet was in being washed, while the other half of us were out doing work on the roadway. We come in at the end of the shift, and the guys had our trucks washed in that, and we'd have to go through and grease them. You know, and as operators, we're the guys that grease. We went through the whole truck, all the plow. Uh, we went through all the uh, lift cylinder and that. We were required to grease that at the end of every uh, snow and ice operation. Make sure the auger systems were greased. You know, and our plows and that, um, that's right, I, don't, I can't show you. Uh, I used to, we had a bucket we filled full of leftover grease. You know, these 30 gallon drums of grease that were pressure fed into the, the the system always had a gallon or two of it left on the sidewalls. So we uh, scraped that out, put them in one gallon buckets, and the mechanics had a parts brush, a round parts brush, gave those to us. We painted the grease onto our plows and that on the moving sections uh, to keep them from freezing up. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. later. But again, our responsibility to grease the vehicles. So, and complete out if this is end of shift, we have whatever paperwork we got to finish out. So uh, let's see. And again, uh, end of season, you know, we clean, we flush out our brine systems. We sort of learned the hard way that we use uh, RV antifreeze now to do the final rinse out. Uh, we got our first insert uh, brine tanker at Dark County and parked it out back. We flushed it out with water, parked it out back, and went out there to load it up for the following year's use, and it already had a hard freeze found all the PVC fittings froze out of it. Yeah, you know, water freezes, broke all the fittings. So we learned real quick, you have to use RV um, antifreeze as the last rinse out to make sure we don't freeze up any of the joints in that. So again, we're trying to get 15 years of service out of our trucks. We'll see some slides here in a few minutes about how expensive they are and you know, what do we do? They're telling us just soap and water washing the truck. We might get another year's worth of service out of it. So, and again, we have a limited budget. Uh, something we started doing is we're not buying brand new plows. Every truck that comes in, we used to. And they're saying we're saving a million dollars a year by reusing our plows. Again, just an emphasis. We have operators who say greasing's a mechanic's job. No, it's our job. And then other things to do to try to get longevity out of our equipment. Fluid film. You know, I've heard of garages, and I want to give credit. I think it's Licking County. I think they said they spend two hundred and fifty dollars per truck to do a six-month application of fluid film. One application will get them through the entire snow and ice season. Um, I know District Seven is using fluid film, and it's applying monitor and apply as needed. You know, I've heard three months, usually at the three month stage, they may have to reapply it. Again, part of that is corrosion control on the vehicles. We don't let the calcium chloride and those really caustic uh, chemicals get into nooks and crannies and rot out the equipment. So another thing we've done is we've gone to uh, like stainless steel beds, aluminum beds that are impervious to the corrosion. You know, there's some county garages and that out there, uh, in other words, county engineers and townships and that, that use salt neutralizers. And the city of Sandusky showed me theirs, and they were using a chemical-based neutralizer, and they found that uh, this was, uh, it had to be washed off the trucks after they applied it because it was caustic to humans. And their bulk tank, they'd leak a little, and it was eating the cement up around it. And they got rid of that, went to an organic based salt neutralizer, which I don't know if it was uh, industrial vinegar 
or not. I've heard a lot of people are going to an industrial vinegar as a salt neutralizer, but they can apply it and leave it alone on the trucks. And then Clear Roads actually has like a one hour seminar, webinar on uh, corrosion control on vehicles and that. And they get into how to do welding, how to lay your metal up so you don't get intrusion of caustic uh, or corrosive chemicals into the beds and other components of the truck. So there's other sources out there on how to get a longer service life out of your equipment. So one of our lessons learned is uh, we have a salt brine pump and it's driven by a hydraulic pump. The photo on the left, you see the hydraulic pump on top and the salt brine pump on the bottom. And that was our lesson learned because in the other photo on the right, the bottom, the hydraulic pumps on the bottom with the salt brine on the top, and those salt brine pumps have a tendency of leaking. You put the hydraulic pump on the bottom and the salt brine leaks down on the hydraulic pump and ruins the hydraulic pump. You have to put a new hydraulic pump. So real simple solution to the problem. Battery boxes are an overlooked area on our trucks. Definitely recommend you pull the cover off and wash those out on a regular basis. If you have grits, you're using grits. I don't think there's a county garage in ODOT that uses grits. Uh, when I was at Dark County, we used grits, you know, 50-50 blend um, or a two to one blend of grit to salt. And my battery box was full of grits after every storm. You know, clean it all out, look at your terminals, if there's any corrosion there, get them cleaned up. And we usually had a red spray. We treated all our terminals to keep them from corroding. Again, our trucks run on battery juice, all our computers. You got to keep our batteries in good shape. Front end loaders. The good old days, they used to be the most abused piece of equipment. Hey, we'd, hop, we'd have a snow and ice event. We'd hop in a loader, run it out to the salt bin, load our truck, let it sit in the salt bin, let it run. You know, at the end of the storm, we'd run it back into the shop, if we remembered, and shut it off, and it sat there till the next snow and ice event. You can imagine what had happened to our loaders by doing that. Now, more than once, we've had Highway Patrol, Sheriff's Department call in, said there's a piece of equipment with the lights on. And supervisors would go out there, and they'd find the loader out in the uh, salt bin still running. Everybody wanted to go home at the end of the event. It's sitting there. Or worse yet, they come in on Monday and find the loader out in the salt barn dead, not running. Batteries are dead. You know, no fuel in it. Then they have to get it running again. You know, the good old days. You know, we aren't supposed to let them run. Nowadays, they've, they've got the diesel turbos. They've got the exhaust uh, regenerators on them. And usually they're programmed to shut off. You set a loader there and let it idle for about five minutes, it'll shut off on its own. You know, if you got one of the older units, you know, save on fuel, save on the environment, you know, shut them off. They'll warm up after a minute or two and then you can go back to your business. Keep it fueled up. More than once I've hopped in a loader and it's down the red. I don't even know if I got enough fuel to get the truck loaded. You know, we top them off at the beginning of the storm and tell somebody you get down to a quarter tank, you top it off again. Take the time to top it off. Wash after shift. Again, nowadays, again, because we have dedicated crews to, to wash our trucks, they wash the loader. They get to wash it and grease it and get it ready for the next storm. So grease, okay. And then it's quite a versatile piece of equipment. And we're doing some different things out there now for loaders. And I, it's great. This is Dark County's loader. And I don't, I don't think it's there anymore because ODOT is doing a three-year turnover on their equipment. You know, it, it makes a whole lot of sense. The first W14 we got at the garage, you know, I don't think we put an engine. I think we put three sets of tires on that one. I know other counties put engines and transmissions in them. And we did three paint jobs on this thing. So over at service life, I mean, we ran them to the point they didn't run anymore. So everybody can imagine the expense and the heavy repair cost. So it's... Um, we're getting close to time, Ron. Oh, we're getting close to time already. Oh, my gosh, it's 11.39, left. a minute left. I know. Time flies okay. when you're talking about oh, something. Oh, it sure does. Love. Man, man, man. I didn't realize I was an hour and a half into this. Sorry, folks. So let's see, real quick thing then on the loader. I may have to pick up here tomorrow on the loader because we, 
you know, like I said, I have to cut off at 11.30 on this, uh, but it's a very versatile piece of equipment. We turn them over every three years. You can ask me questions on how we do that, but we get all the bells and whistles. We've added backup um, cameras, uh, scale on these things to make sure we don't overload trucks or when we sell you folks salt, you can do that. And it's just phenomenal what we're able to do. Plus the attachments on the front, snow blowers on the front. I've seen them put straight plows on the front or those huge uh, scoops that you move snow around in parking lots and that. So let's see. And I think, yep. So I think I'm going to have to call it there. I didn't realize an hour and a half. Isn't that something? So quick. I don't have time. I don't have time for questions today. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if we're going to totally close it out. We can hang on a minute and get questions. And I'll remember tomorrow we'll pick up with this photo from Knox County and their solution to chunks getting into their auger systems. So really appreciate everybody attending in that. I'll turn this back over to Victoria and let her close out the, uh, the presentation. Thanks, Ron. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to send you a downloadable spreadsheet of the questions that did come in. So maybe you can just, okay. um, you know, look at those, look those over today, later, and then open up with those tomorrow. So. Okay, sure. All right. All right. Well, thank Sounds you so good. much. We've got great comments, people saying awesome. Thanks so much for the great session. I know they'll look forward to tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. And we'll see see you quote unquote tomorrow for part two. Take care.